please pray with me. Startle us, O God, with your word. Silence in us any voice but your own. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and redeemer. Amen. We welcome everyone, really. That's what it says on the banner hanging outside of our sanctuary doors. We welcome everyone, really. Now, I would say that for any institution, that statement is much more aspirational than it is a reality, even in the church, or perhaps especially in the church, because we are a body made up of broken and flawed human beings, we don't always get that welcome right. Now, I do want to qualify that statement. As my colleague Victor often says, we welcome everyone, but we don't welcome all behaviors. This is so true. Each and every person who walks through these doors, each and every person we encounter inside and outside the walls of this building, is a beloved child of God, and they are indeed welcome. But not all actions or behaviors are of God, and any act that is violent or harmful or dehumanizing of others is, quite honestly, not welcome. Robert Jones Jr., a student of James Baldwin, says it like this. We can disagree and still love each other unless your disagreement is rooted in my oppression and denial of my humanity and right to exist. In other words, yes, all are welcome. But if welcoming you is dependent on the exclusion and unwelcome of others, that is just not going to work here. Radical welcome, like the kind Jesus practiced, freed people from the burdens and oppressions of their current society. It received all people as fully human, created in the image of God, as beloved and precious children of the Creator. And to Jesus, all were welcome, really. It wasn't aspirational, it was lived and embodied and sometimes even learned. But despite Jesus's radical welcome, not all chose or could bring themselves to stay and receive that welcome. In fact, next week we'll hear about a young man who was welcomed and loved and invited by Jesus but rather than being able to embrace that welcome, he chose to walk away, where he could not accept the kind of change and transformation that welcome would require. Scripture says he was shocked and went away grieving. Many others, however, especially those who were on the margins, did receive that welcome and were relieved and granted new life through Jesus. He sat with sinners and prostitutes, tax collectors, and those in need of healing. He broke bread with those deemed unclean and unworthy. He was called a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners by elite religious leaders. That's the Jesus we say we follow today. Jesus chose welcome, such a radical welcome of all people that it often offended those who held power and privilege, even when they were welcomed and loved just as much as everyone else. As the saying goes, when we're accustomed to privilege, equality feels like oppression. Let me say that again. When we're accustomed to privilege, equality can feel like oppression. To be lumped together and treated as equals with those whom Jesus associated with was, to some, offensive and unacceptable. So some who approached Jesus, like the rich young man that we will hear about next week, 
could not stand to give up the power and the privilege that the world offered him to enter into Christ's welcome. But none of us here have chosen that path. We're here because something about Jesus's welcome has compelled us and convicted us. We have not walked away. Instead, we have chosen to receive that welcome. And as such, no longer will we be bound by the ways of this world. No longer will we be wooed by the halls of power and the pool of privilege. While some of our elected leaders and perhaps even some of our appointed judges may not be able to shed such temptations, we have chosen to receive God's welcome and we have not walked away. And that's why I am convinced that this here, when we welcome others through Christ, is what will change the world. I believe that. Even in times that seem so wrought with injustice, I believe that love and welcome will be what changes this world. You see, this radical Jesus even welcomed children, and they never rejected that welcome. Children in Jesus' day had little to no agency. They were basically the property of the patriarch of the family. And without that adult male to advocate on their behalf, they were voiceless, powerless, and very, very vulnerable. When scripture tells us that we must be like a child to enter God's kingdom, it doesn't simply mean that we must have some kind of childlike quality or characteristics such as innocence or purity or receptiveness that gets us in. For a long time, that is how today's passage was interpreted by most biblical scholars with that focus on the characteristics of children. But in the last 30 years or so, many commentators have changed the interpretive tune about that phrase, as a little child, to focus not on a child's traits, but on their status in society. Ched Myers argues, the child represents another category of those marginalized and dominated, like women, the poor, and the unclean. The child was, in fact, the least in familial and societal structures. Jesus is thus inviting the disciples into a new reality of community and family, where the least becomes the model for the disciples. And this means the disciple takes up the powerlessness and the vulnerability of a child. So not only did Jesus welcome children, but Jesus expected us to become like a child, to give up power and to live in solidarity with the least of these. Here we have this itinerant homeless rabbi who is gaining in popularity and fame by practicing an upside down, backwards understanding of the world. People are hearing about his radical welcome, so women, children, and utter outcasts of society come to him, hoping to receive a blessing, a miracle, daring to dream of a new life. But Jesus' network of male disciples just don't <coughs> seem to get it, do they? They are constantly guarding the gate, fencing the table, telling others, Go away, hush, you are not welcome here, trying to maintain their good old boys club. But Jesus says again and again to the contrary. Yes, you are, you are welcome here. There is a place at the table for you. Friends, when we proclaim that we welcome everyone really, it's aspirational. We're really trying to live into that. But there are many human barriers that prevent us from embodying that fully. Sometimes we catch ourselves acting a little bit more like those disciples than Jesus. The Reverend Lawrence Richardson is an educated, queer, black, progressive, transgender pastor in the United Church of Christ. 
And when he sees churches with banners like ours declaring that all are welcome, he wonders, would I, with all that I bring, be welcomed in that place? And he challenges the church to really think about what we are saying with such signage. He asks, not only are we prepared for the beautiful tapestry of human diversity that might show up, but how are we preparing ourselves to receive all God's people? How might we extend welcome to those who are differing in physical and mental abilities, to younger generations or families with children, to people or different, of different racial and ethnic groups, to those in the LGBTQI community, to seniors facing uncertainty in aging, to the survivors of domestic violence or sexual assault, and to the fullness of each and every person beyond any label or demographic. How might we extend welcome? Richardson writes, Doing life with people who are different from us or who have had experiences different from our own takes courage. It requires us to take into account the social dynamics that inform what each person brings to the table of our common life together. Genuine hospitality, true welcome to the table involves more than inviting people into our space. We do not offer full hospitality when we embrace those who are new or different by bringing them into a community that is marked by a fixed, rigid, unchanging identity. A truly hospitable community is marked by its willingness to change in response to the newcomer. When we say all are welcome, we aren't merely announcing that anyone is welcome to become just like one of us. Instead, we are proclaiming, or should be, that we want others to come in and help all of us change, to help all of us grow in love, acceptance, and in community. And let's face it, that's hard. To be open to that kind of transformation, to be willing to become a new and growing and changing community that is marked by those who are here, that is hard. So when we, Calvary Presbyterian Church says, we welcome everyone, really, I think if we're honest, we mean we're really trying. But that change is hard. And we're accustomed to the way things have always been done and that we are creatures of comfort and sometimes we mistake our own preferences as the only right way to do things. But we are trying. Listen, back in August, we gathered around the Lord's table as we do every first Sunday of the month, as we will later this morning. And back in August, some disorderly child felt like he could just come on up to the chancel with the pastors, spin around in circles and stomp his feet on the chancel, he smushed his body in between me and the table as I said the words of institution, making me spill grape juice all over my robe and the table. And then he thought he could just stand up in front and help serve the elements. I'm sure his parents were mortified. <laughs> I know because I'm his parent, by the way. But the community welcomed him nonetheless. I didn't hear from a single person who was appalled or disgruntled at his behavior. I'm sure we all exist. I was appalled and disgruntled at his behavior. <laughs> but no one said anything to me. In fact, I actually had a few who encouraged me and shared their delight at his presence. I'm sorry, but he's downstairs this morning. <laughs> Mama has her limits. But something about this church this community, all of you, signals to my four-year-old that he is welcome here, really. Even at his worst behavior, he is welcome here, really. And I know that's just one small example. 
But the thing about hospitality and radical welcome is that it's like a muscle. The more we use it, the stronger it gets. The more we practice it, the better we become at it. And the good news is we all know what it feels like to be welcomed because God has welcomed each and every one of us. So what we can say without any hesitation or qualifiers is this. God welcomes everyone, really. And we're trying our best to do the same. Once a month here at Calvary, we are invited to come and dine at the welcome table, the Lord's table, invited by our host, Jesus the Christ. Sometimes children and youth help welcome us to this table, either by design or because their parents can't seem to stop them. This ritual, this sacrament in which we partake, it may seem like we're just getting in line to eat a piece of bread soggy with grape juice. But I believe something happens in this moment, something life transforming, something earth shattering, something that aligns our world to be a little bit more like the kingdom of God, God intended. There is an inbreaking of the radical hospitality of Jesus Christ. And we are united with believers in every time and place with those who've gone before us. Imagine all those we've lost in the past couple of years, those who've gone before us, dine with us at this table. Those on the other side of the globe who began celebrating World Communion Sunday yesterday in Asia, Africa, Europe, they dine with us at this table. And we are united with one another, with those sitting in our pews in this sanctuary, some of whom we know nothing about, and some of whom we know way too much about. <laughs> and somehow, through Christ's welcome, we become one. And we are changed, made a little bit different than when we came, because we are fed and given a place at this table. Sure, it's symbolic. That's what the reformer Zwingli argued. But it's more than that. I agree with Calvin in that sense. It's transformative because Christ is here, not necessarily in the elements of bread and wine as our Catholic sisters and brothers believe, but Christ is presiding at the table in the act of communing with one another, in the breaking of bread with sisters and brothers, that rabble-rousing Jesus is here with us. And we will never be the same because of it. As we prepare our hearts to receive this meal that will not leave us the same as when we came, I invite you in singing a statement of faith with me, one that I believe through and through, so much so that I will even sing in front of you. The words are as such. God welcomes all, strangers and friends. God's love is strong, and it never ends. Sing with me if you know the song. If you don't know the song, sing even louder. Why not? God welcomes all strangers. 